It's Friday, and I'm back with the next in our Fanzine Friday series. Today we're taking a look at the Dungeon Chronicle number four. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer, and this is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, I pull a fanzine from my collection off the shelf for a closer look. Today it's the Dungeon Chronicle number four from 1977. Hope you enjoy the video. We're continuing our look at the fanzine called the Dungeon Chronicle. It's a product of the Sword and Sorcery Society of Columbia, Missouri. Uh, it is eight and a half by 11 paper, basically photocopied, mine's just bound together with a paper clip or a uh, clip binder. Uh, this one has some interesting artwork. It says on it, it's from March. That's the first time we see any type of a date. It's a March from 1977. Here's the cover artwork. <clears throat> it is not uh, labeled with an artist's name. Kevin McCauley had been doing the art. I'm not sure if this is his or not. I kind of like it. It's like a very narrow dungeon hallway with this um, uh, robed, cloaked figure carrying a sword. I don't know if he's undead or like just some, some type of evil you know, priest or fighter or mage or whatever, but uh, in any event, it's, it's very reminiscent of their, their style, right? Very <clears throat> sort of hand-drawn, very homemade. Here's a table of contents. They have an introductory page and a table of contents uh, here as well. They have an article on elves. Uh, they have an article on poison and the effect of poison, some suggested changes. Tavern happenings, which is a random chart. Uh, several pages where they talk about dragons and how to use dragons in your campaign. Magic Scrolls and Treasure Maps. Uh, naval Combat, which is, follows the issue um, prior, had a discussion of Naval Combat, and they've got a little bit of tweaks suggested by some different authors. Clerics, giving clerics dying curses as an added ability. And a several page article on the Cthulhu Mythos. And finally, the comic that we've seen before from uh, Kevin McCauley. Uh, as I mentioned previously, in this fanzine, it really does seem like they sort of rotate who's going to be responsible for the product. It says here to, that the uh, product is from Randall Young. You'll recall Paul Young was the uh, person responsible for the very first issue of the Dungeon Chronicle. And then finally this gentleman, Jim uh, Lamaru, maybe mispronouncing that. Uh, he and Kevin get together and write the Naval Combat uh, article. So here's our article on elves. You know, they've talked a little bit before about their idea of elves. They draw down on the Tolkien um, mythos or, or writings is some of their inspiration. They've got sylvan elves, which are also known as wood elves, and then the Eldar. And then the Eldar are divided into different categories as well. They suggest that each of these different types of elves should have different um, level abilities, max level abilities they can go to between mage and, and fighter, which is the way it worked in the original rules. And then this I thought was kind of interesting. I'll blow it up here uh, get myself out of the way. They've got these rules for um, for elves that show you certain bonuses, etc. And so I thought this was interesting. I didn't find these. They might be in the old brown box or wood grain box um, rules. I didn't see them. But they've given them a plus one bonus with the bone sword. They've got a bonus on saving throws versus basically any type of um, natural based spell. So cold based, fire based, electric electricity based, same thing. They fight better against any uh, type of monster that draws from an element of nature. The improvision of course, and then this is a, one I've never seen anywhere before, a bonus against the uh, phantasmal forces. Basically that they're sort of more you know immune to things like a phantasmal force or other types of illusions. And then of course these bonuses for hearing better than others, being more aware of secret concealed doors and things like that, and immune to the effects of disease and aging. Which is really interesting, you know, because what they say in their comments is that in their world, elves are essentially immortal. So there is no such thing as getting older for an elf. You can't sort of um, attack them and make them older. You also can't, they basically can't get disease, which would be perhaps an argument for why they're immune to the effects of the ghoul that would normally paralyze. It's just that kind of um, whatever it is in the ghoul's attack that causes that just to basically won't affect them because of their uh, immortal nature. 
The next thing is this chart on poison. And so they have 18 different levels of poison. They don't really talk about the natural follow-up, so you're gonna have to go through now and give an intensity level to every single creature in your campaign, every poison trap, you give, them a, give them a level. And then they've got a chart where you've got the level of the um, character, fighters, clerics, mages, etc. And then they have different, essentially saving throws at different levels. You need to use the matrix to figure out whether um, you, what your saving roll would be. And they still have some things that are sort of like automatic death. Actually, on their chart, there's some things you don't even get a saving throw. We got a little chart on tavern happenings. Um, they keep referencing back to something called winches and winnikegs, which I guess maybe I need to search for. It's not clear to me without the history if that's a real thing or just an inside joke. But anyway, it's basically saying we've got a chart with, um, it looks like 12 things here, but they have enough numbers so you could write in your own to go all the way up to 20 for different things that would happen randomly, right? A brawl, thieves come around and try to pickpocket, drunks, uh, somebody important comes in, et cetera, et cetera. Just to give you something to help you fill out the, uh, a random chart to help you fill out the uh, narrative about it being in a tavern. There's a really big article here on dragons. They put a lot of thought into it. They talk about a number of topics. Um, they talk about some of the books they've read that are their sources. And then they talk about the size uh, because they say there's a lot of variability in different books, etc., how big a dragon might be. They talk about their breath weapons, which their concept is the breath weapon or originates from the interaction of the stomach acid of the dragon with some other chemical their body produces to create the breath weapon. As a consequence, they only allow a breath weapon to be used once every eight hours because they say that that stomach acid has to sort of recharge if that makes sense. They talk about subduing a dragon and how that would work, how long it would last consequences for like a second roll to fight through the sub being subdued if their life's in danger if you try to steal their their treasure hoard things like that and they talk about how you could basically either get an egg or a very young dragon and potentially raise it to be uh, supportive of a player character or an NPC and how you could create that kind of bond they have a list of maps treasure maps you would roll and whether it's treasure like gems and gold magic or magic and treasure uh, they've got all kinds of different charts. How much gold would be supposed to be there? What type of magic items are supposed to be there? Um, whether it's going to be guarded or unguarded? How many days away it's going to be from where you find it? How accurately described is it? So it's going to get you right to the spot or it's going to get you, you know, north of this city or, or that kind of thing. Um, and even what direction it would be randomly from where your characters are if you need something, something like that. The other thing that they uh, cover in here are magic scrolls. So they basically have a chart, uh, you roll how many spells, one, two, three, seven, or it's a protection scroll or it's a curse scroll. Magic user, clerical, druid, type, and then if, of course if it's spells you would roll those randomly. Protection scrolls they say last for two turns in a five foot radius. Lycanthropy, undead, elementals, magic, and demons. Um, and then they say uh, the level the magic user using it can increase saving throws. So third level magic user plus three on saving throws, etc. Um, and then they have an effectiveness table for this. Minus one hit probability, minus three hit probability, minus five hit probability. Um, automatically only can do half damage. If completely impervious to the creature. Um, destroys the creature on contact. So that's pretty intense. The curse scroll, they say, always has some spells on it and then a curse. One curse, curse plus a spell, curse plus two spells, uh, or what they call the super whammy curse. I'm not sure what that is. but uh, And they say, you know, the curse is undetectable. You would tell the character, look, there's one, two, three spells on here, and you'd randomly determine if the curse is A, B, or C. When they tell you they're going to try and read that, that one that's cursed, then the curse takes effect. Um, so, in theory, if you just said there are three spells, do you try and read it and say, well, no, wait, the curse won't take effect until either you read it later or maybe you're smart enough to go back to town and have somebody identify it for you and protect you from the curse. Their ideas for curses, a disease, polymorph into an insect, polymorph, polymorph into a frog, worm, turn to stone, die, teleport away, a uh, monster immediately comes up and attacks you, or teleport you to a monster's lair. So... 
none of those curses are good, but you know, that's curses are supposed to be. Curses, I think, are something that were used a lot, I think, by Gygax. I don't know about Arneson. And uh, I think are a great part of something to be added into your campaign. It should not be something that never happens. I, I, I like the idea that curses happen a lot. You know, you can always get back to town and get the curse removed. Uh, but lots of fun things can happen from a role-playing point of view with a, with a curse. Um, the next one is this article on adding springles, which is a weapon uh, into naval combat. Um, I'm probably not going to give much attention to that here, but they just say it wasn't you know, realistic enough, and then they've got suggestions. The next article is on clerics dying curses, and the idea is that because of clerics' connection to a deity when they're dying, they have a percentage chance to be able to curse uh, someone or something. And they have four levels, um, killed random death by monster, um, killed on purpose, like someone sought this cleric out to kill him or her, uh, killed because of the devotion to a deity, gives you an even better chance, and then just sort of random death because of like a trap, you know, or falling or something like that. And then they have levels of curses based on the level of the cleric. The higher level the cleric is, the more potent their curses could be, and they've got some suggestions about how the curses would work what different types of curses might be. This is interesting, I thought, because right this predates the Cthulhu being in the Deities and Demigods book, but here's a three-page article giving you basically the background to the Cthulhu mythos, mythos and suggesting this would be a fun thing to bring into your campaign. They even got some suggestions on how uh, different character classes, like Druids in particular, might be able to interact with some of the, I don't know if to call them creatures or deities from Cthulhu. And then we have the comic, uh, just a couple of pages here. Uh, it's called Kletzo Kobold and Paul Young White Hawks Chamber of Horrors. And it's basically all of these different, um, I think, like uh, alternate character classes. So that seems to be the joke, is that he's created all these different alternate character classes. Um, that's it. This one's a little shorter than the last couple. Uh, again, I think these are fantastic fanzines that give you a great idea to what a really, I think, a, a thoughtful and active uh, campaign group was doing in you know the middle of the United States in the early days of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, we got a couple more of these to go, so we'll cover those in the weeks ahead. Hope you guys are enjoying the video series. Hope you're subscribed. Please have your friends take a look at the channel if you think they would enjoy our content. Uh, enjoy the weekend, and until next time, my friends, keep rolling twenties.